Hello. I thought that it would be appropriate on the eve of Father's Day 2018 to deal with the topic of God as our Father, Abba. And um, so to that end, we're going to uh, dig in. And there's a related issue that I uh, want to deal with. And that's uh, the current attempts to change the Bible's language to make it gender neutral uh, because it uh, is intimately bound up with the concept of God as Father because that's what folks want to get rid of. They want to get rid of God as Father and the other masculine images and either make it feminine or androgynous. So we'll deal with that after um, we discuss spiritual adoption or God as our Father. So let me first read just a few verses from Galatians and Romans. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Then Romans, for all who are led by the Spirit are God's, Spirit of God, are, are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The year was 1974, and I remember distinctly reading from J.I. Packer's excellent book, Knowing God, the following quote, and this is from memory, so I'm paraphrasing. Justification is the most basic blessing of the gospel because it meets our most fundamental need, and that is to deal with our problem of objective guilt for a holy God. But the highest blessing of the gospel is spiritual adoption because of the intimacy with God it entails. God could have forgiven our sins and stopped there, but he did it. His holy intent was to create a family in which he would be Abba to, and we would be the Most High God's sons and daughters. That obviously had an impact on me. Um, remembering it so so many years afterwards 40 some years later and I think that Packer uh, is is right that the doctrine of justification which is an article upon which the church stands and falls is the most fundamental blessing of the gospel but the highest in terms of intimacy, is being able to call God Abba. Wow. Um, so again, in light of Father's Day, I thought it appropriate to deal with the salient aspect of God, uh, which I had not yet addressed, his fatherhood. Our union with Christ is the vehicle with which we are brought into uh, and appropriate the many rich blessings that flow from being in Christ. And that union with Christ brings in its wake our justification, our adoption, and countless other blessings. But my first point is this, and it's crucial. It's only those who are in union with Christ, those who are in Christ, that have God as their father. As John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, 
he gave the right to become children of God. So you're familiar with the typical conception of the man or woman on the street is that, you know, um, is that God is a father of all people, regardless of what they believe. However, the text above and throughout the Bible makes clear that the necessary and sufficient condition for being a child of God is by faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is God's Son by nature. His title, Son of God, highlights this fact. Humans move from the status of being children of wrath, which is in Ephesians 2, 1 and following, to being adopted children of the living God via being united with Christ through faith in him. A while, a while back, it was fashionable in acad academic circles to summarize all religions in terms of the universal fatherhood, fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of mankind. But that summary was so simplistic because it overlooked the obvious, serious, mutually exclusive truth claims of the various religions. Jesus himself, you know, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John, 10, John 14, 6. And when we contemplate all that the Son of God suffered in order that we might become his adopted children to redeem us, as it says in Galatians 4, 8, the precious blood that was shed to redeem us, then we will see just how heretical this notion is of the universal fatherhood of God. And it also overlooks a horrible spiritual condition mankind is in apart from Christ. It's basically a heretical affirmation of universalism. In verses 6 and 15 that I just uh, read, we are told that we have been given the right to call God Abba, Father. And I know less the theologian John Frame has affirmed that one legitimate translation of Abba is Daddy. And I've been around the block when it comes to this issue. And some people might, um, you know, raise some eyebrows about that translation, but bottom line, being able to call God Abba is astonishing. It is. As his sons and daughters, we can call the creator of the cosmos, Daddy, or Dad, or Papa, whichever you think is the better translation. But, you know, as I said, I know enough <laughs> about this topic that some folks will disagree um, with the Daddy part, but that's fine. But what I would uh, ask is, say the word Abba out loud several times and see what it sounds like to you. Regardless, the point is, is that we have incredible, amazing intimacy with our holy God. In the Old Testament, there was very little talk of God as our Father and hardly any as far as, you know, directly in prayer. But Jesus tells us that the term we are to use to communicate in prayer in the uh, uh, Lord's Prayer is our Father, right? and then Abba. You know, can we speak to Jesus and even the Holy Spirit? And sure, but Father is a pattern for us to pray. In fact, some have said that God's covenant name in the Old Testament Yahweh is, was Yahweh, but his covenant name in the New Testament is Abba. Um... As I indicated, some are hesitant to call God Abba um, because they think it will detract from his lordship and transcendence. But remember, he's also imminent. And calling God Father is a term of authority as well as intimacy. A father in biblical categories is the head of the household. 
So intimacy does not negate authority and control. God is Father indicates authority over his family. The highest blessing of the gospel, y'all. Do you ever actually call God Abba, Daddy, or whoever, how you choose to translate the, that Aramaic word? You know, I'm not sure why it's not translated. It's curious. Abba is an Aramaic word. Um, it's a, it's a head scratch. May I ask you to try something? Try calling God Abba out loud several times so you can hear yourself. The intimacy is unspeakably wonderful and beautiful. The anxieties, the fears, the regrets that we all have seem to melt away in the presence of Abba. I suspect the devil is particularly hateful over this notion and does not want us to know or experience it because it brings to the forefront just how much God loves us, the height, depth, width, and length that Paul talks about in his prayers in Ephesians 1 and 3. You know, we talk, uh, I've been talking about experiencing God's attributes and none more so than that of God's fatherliness. Again, I think of what Packer said in that amazing uh, chapter in that amazing life-changing ch book. Again, it's called Knowing God, and if you've never read it, uh, I would highly recommend it. He uh, said that we can use this truth, God as our Father, as a spiritual barometer of how we're doing spiritually at any given point. Uh, he was, what he was trying to get at was that how much we are making in our minds and hearts at any given moment of the day of God as our Father or Abba, how much we're you know we're making or think thinking and leaning on God as as Father or Abba would indicate how we are doing spiritually. You understand what I'm saying? At any given point during the day, how much you're actually thinking of God as as Abba as Daddy, that will indicate how well you're doing spiritually. It's the highest blessing. You know, for example, anxiety and thoughts of Abba simply cannot coexist. One of the verses talked about, you know, the dispelling of fear. Um, I'm using my words, but I must confess that nothing shows my own sinfulness more than how little I make of this precious truth in my own life moment by moment. So what's your spiritual temperature? Do you verbally call God Father or better Abba, Daddy? Uh, like I said, I know I get a little heap of saying Daddy, but I don't really care. Take it up with Daddy. Nobody, I think, those of you know me, nobody has a higher view of God's transcendence, but he has revealed to us, now listen to me, he has revealed to us that we must call him Abba. And that's the truth. He's the one who has told us. So who are we to be too, too spiritual to, to not do it? For some of you, this may uh, bring back painful memories of your earthly father calling God Father. But may I say tenderly that many folks are in the same boat, and it's not unusual to learn by contrast. You know, where your father was imperfect and sinful, our Heavenly Father is tender and perfect. So please learn about Abba by contrast if you need to. You know, if this is the highest blessing, then we should make it the highest priority in how we live and pray. The God who is omnipresent is Abba. The God who is omnipotent is our Abba. The God who knows all things is our Abba. 
The High King and Creator of Heaven and Earth is our Abba. So, I wish I could go on and on about this, but may the Lord illumine your heart as to the depths and the riches of the meaning of God as Father and Abba. This also indicates, and one of the implications of calling God Father, means that we're part of a family of brothers and sisters, the family of God, the household of God. And this is our true and forever family. All right, so let's transition here. Speaking of God as our Father raises an issue that is raging today regarding making the Bible gender sensitive, getting rid of the focus on father and making feminine or at least androgynous, making it feminine or androgynous. You know, um, since I have def defined theology as applying all of the word of God to all of life, then it's only appropriate that we speak to this issue, which is of intense concern to many people today. You may not be aware of it, but it, uh, it's, it really is a contemporary um, hot button issue. And it's, it's obvious that it's intimately bound up with all we have just said about God as Father. And there are some loud voices that are crying out to get rid of this Abba talk, this Father talk. And all these names and pronouns that are masculine. So what is at stake, y'all? And how do we respond? Well, I have my own notes and I, I have some um, John Frame. I'm going to lean on some here. But uh, first, this is a question about imagery. Nobody is arguing that God is literally male or female. Um, except if we think about the, the body of the glorified Christ, but that's not what uh, is at issue here. The issue is that of God the Father, um, the incorporeal God, um, and the image that's used in Scripture. That's what's being argued about. Um, the NIV... Um, there was a huge hullabaloo about that a few years ago, and um, you may be aware of that, so let me uh, respond. You know, we've been talking about God's attributes, and all of them are at stake in this debate. As we have seen in our discussions about God's traits, God's nature uh, and his names are of great importance theologically. They reveal him. And his attributes are who God is. His names and so forth reveal who he is. So do we have a right to change the biblical concept of who God is? I'm stating it very bluntly that this attempt by radical feminists is nothing less than biblical vandalism and an escapade, escapade, blasphemous escapade into trying to change the very nature of God. To underscore the last point, it is also important to recognize that in Scripture, God names himself. His names, attributes, and images are not the result of human speculation or imagination, but a revelation. He has not authorized change in the, ba in the balance of male and female imagery. You know, there is some female imagery in, in the Bible. And we should not presume to make such changes on our own authority. In Scripture, the most central name for God is Lord. Remember, we talked about that in his lordship attributes, which indicates his headship of the covenants between himself and his creatures. 
In scripture, rule in the covenant community is typically a male prerogative. Kings, priests, and prophets are generally male. And without a doubt, authority in the church is given to male elders. 1 Corinthians 14, 35, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 15. And these arguments are rooted in the creation order, um, which is unchanging. Uh, transgenerational, transcultural. Uh, they're not rooted in uh, the culture of the day. The husband is the head of the covenant formed by marriage. So a switch to feminine, feminine imagery for God would certainly dilute and I would say um, ruin the strong emphasis on covenant authority that is central to the biblical doctrine of God. Um, this is one reason why some feminist theologians, including this lady named Johnson, actually oppose the idea of God's lordship. And not a few of the feminist theologians appeal to um, the, the f feminine gods uh, that we can see in the Old Testament, such as Ashtoreth, um, it be, because they are uh, female deities, and um, you know, it makes me you know, question their theological integrity, to, to say the least. Um, okay, so God relates to his people as husband to wife. Obviously, this profound image would be obscured if we are to regard God as female. This is important not only for the doctrine of God, but also for the doctrine of man, theological anthropology. It is important for both male and female Christians to know and to meditate deeply on the fact that in relation to God, they are all female. We are all female in relation to God. Wives called to submit in love to their gracious husbands. It is the church, not God, that is feminine in its spiritual nature. Um, one frequent suggestion of compromise is that we eliminate all sexually distinctive language, either male or female, in referring to God. Instead of Father, we would then refer to God as parent or creator. Unisex language, however, inevitably suggests that God is impersonal and that is completely unacceptable from a biblical standpoint. Certainly to eliminate father in favor of a more abstract term would be to eliminate something very precious to Christian believers and it would destroy the highest blessing of the gospel that we just spoke about. God is our father and us being adopted as his sons and daughters. You know, has the use of preponderantly pre male imagery for God resulted in the oppression of women? There's a deep divide between feminist and non-feminist Christians as to what constitutes oppression. In traditional Christianity, it is not degrading for a, a woman to be submissive to her husband and excluded from office of elder in the church. Often, in the view of feminist writers, it is degrading for anybody to be subject to the authority of other persons, even of God. But submission to authority of others is unavoidable in human life for both men and women. This is one of the hardest lessons that fallen human beings have to learn. You know, much more can be said on this issue. Certainly men have abused women to a terrible extent through history. And certainly both men and women have sometimes justified this abuse by a misunderstanding of male headship and of the Bible's male imagery for God. But... We don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. 
And it would be hard to show that any better understanding of God or any more wholesome relationship between the sexes would result from the substitution of female or impersonal imagery for the male imagery. So my conclusion, along with frames, is that we should follow the, the Bible's pattern of predominantly male imagery for God with occasional female imagery as the Bible itself uses. Um, and that's that. So the, really what it boils down to is that if, if we change the language in, in scripture where we're doing violence to the very character of, of God and um, taking the word of God and, and vandalizing the word of God and the God himself. So let us pray. Father, Abba, what a joy and what a privilege it is to be able to call the God of the universe, Daddy, Abba. Ah, how sweet that is. Please teach us to the depths of, and the core of our being what it means to call you Abba, not just intellectually but really let it sink deep into the core of our beings and let it change us from the inside out for jesus sake amen thank you happy father's day guys